Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Bids, and today we're continuing the theme with the Audrain Automotive Museum, and we're in their collection facility where they house all the things that aren't currently on display. And I'm joined by Sean O'Donnell, who's one of the collection managers, and today we're going to talk about some cars. Yeah. You guys have just the most unbelievable <laughs> stuff here. A, lot, like, a little bit of everything. Well, truly a little bit of everything. <laughs> so there's a lot to talk about. We won't get to necessarily every car, but there's a lot I want to highlight, and uh, well, let's go talk about some cars. Let's do it. We're going to start this discussion by talking about Porsches, because they're a huge <laughs> fixture in this collection. And we're standing in front of a row of yellow Porsches. That's so right. Obviously, 918, Carrera GT, GT2 RS, and just keeps going. Yeah, go keeps and going and going. Going and going. <laughs> so why was yellow a specific theme for Porsches? Why did you guys choose that color? Well, yellow, uh, uh, easy answer. The owner just simply liked yellow. So, um, okay, and, as, and it started, as we can see, with the Carrera GT being in finance yellow, which now obviously has become a figment of the collection, if you will. Um, and it's a special color for a Carrera GT, which is uh, really cool. But what also is special about this, starting with, four, uh, with the Carrera GT, it's chassis 486. It was bought new. And that theme continues to this day from the 918 being chassis 486 and any limited edition Porsche from the 911R, Sport Classic, yeah. all number 486. So we just got the Dakar, as you saw the other day, and the number we actually put on the side was 486. So a little cool tie in there as well. Well, yeah, as a collection, as like a historical thing, it totally yeah. makes sense to tie yeah. in like that. And I love that when you walk in, because we walked in, this was the first thing we saw. Was yeah, Yellow pretty. It's, it makes a statement. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> of all of them, of course, like my favorite, without question, is the Carrera GT. I Absolutely. Mean, just, we were talking about it earlier, and like I think that is one of the most impressive cars to drive. Uh, obviously, Doug's is mm -hmm. amazing, uh, and he always wanted a yellow one, but the price differentials are so expensive now. Yeah. Um, but just to see one, it's always special to see a Carrera GT. Right. But the thing that's amazing to me is you have potentially the greatest driver's car ever built. Mm -hmm. It still really is a car that only car enthusiasts know. When, when That's Doug, right, like, yeah. When Doug would have his around, like the thing he loves the most is like the people who come up and talk to him about it, they just like, they, they're they enthusiasts of the car and know who he is yeah. and the connection. But you can kind of park them places. You can. People don't really know. They're just like, oh, it's like a, my dad had a career. Everybody yeah. says that. They come it's like, oh, my oh, uncle had a career. It's like, yeah, I don't, yeah. like I don't think it was one. this. And yeah, exactly. it, it, no, it, it, it's a great point because, you know, we, like you said earlier, we have a wide variety of cars. And like, if you're driving the Bugatti Chiron, like right. you have on your shirt, everybody, I mean, everybody, kids, pe non-car people looks at you and you can, you can't park it anywhere, right? right? Like you said with this, you know, you're driving around town, very few people, really know the extent of what it is. And there's something special to be that. said. Yeah, there's something special to be said about that, which, you know, goes into the, the, the whole allure of the Carrera GT. Yeah, unbelievable, but such a special row of Porsches. But like I said, there are a lot of really cool Porsches yep. here, so we'll go talk about some more of them. Sure, so absolutely. Yes. Easy for me to talk about, right? <laughs> There are a lot of significant Porsches in this collection, but this yeah. one, like we've been nerding about this for a while. <laughs> this is a special one. Well, not to most people, it just looks like another SC target. It's yeah, like, it's guards not, red. Yeah, it's just like it's not a big deal. It's kinda, right. But what I like about it, like Curry GT in a way, is that it's a sleeper. So why is this one interesting? So this is a pretty unique car because this is actually a, a three-year build. It took us about three years from start to finish on this, and this was done by Bruce Canepa's team. And it was originally done because when we purchased the Singer, the previous owner was quite tall. So we sent it back to Singer and we um, got new seats put into the Singer. So we essentially had an extra set of Singer seats. What do you do when you have an extra set of Singer seats? You build a car. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Next lot. <logic. laughs> so what this was, this was a, a pretty beat up SC. We, we kind of didn't have an idea of what we should do to it. And the owner thought, hey, let's, let's build this car. Canapa kind of did their own take out of an outlaw. And when I tell you they hit it out of the park, this car is one of the most epic cars that we own. And it is another one of those going to the Carrera GT conversation where, you know, you can park this at a grocery store and someone no, may just think it's an SC, but. I love that. So what's, what's under the hood specifically? It's a four liter Roth Sport engine with over 400 horsepower. It is the most absurd driving car. It's one of those cars that at 50 miles an hour, you're, you're laughing hysterically just cause it's so fun. It's got so much torque, so much power. It's loud in the right ways. Steering is on point. Brakes are perfect, and it's just you know it's 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 a car that you have to think about 
what you're doing. You put your phone away okay. and you just focus on the experience and that's what this car is. And there's not many cars like that anymore. This well, is I, this is one of them. And I love like you were, you were pointing out like this car, like compared to the Singer, which has like crazy wide wheels. And, yep. Like, has a lot more recognition these days. Correct. You can tell a singer right away. Yeah. This car is so much more just under the radar. Correct. Despite it's being a guard's red knight. Right. It really is. You know, it's like, the original body. It's not carbon fiber. You know, nothing has really been done to the body. We added the whale tail. Other than that, it everything about this car has been is pretty much bespoke. Because when you add that kind of power to a traditional SC, you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to, you know, have upgraded suspension, etc. So it did take a while. It took about three years. But let me tell you, it was absolutely worth the wait. And this is one of those cars that we really enjoy bringing people out in because they are blown away about the experience this thing can provide. I so wish it weren't raining. I, I know, we would take you out, trust me. I will happily me. come back. <laughs> car seems like such a ride. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, definitely one to point out. I love this car. Yeah. Now we're standing by the Sport Classic 911. Yeah. This spec stands out, obviously. I'm a sucker for Golf livery, so yeah. tell me a little bit more about this car. Yeah, so obviously a Sport Classic, Golf livery, like you said. Our Singer is kind of Singer's take on Golf livery. It's not exactly spot on golf livery, but we thought about what, how we should spec this. A lot of the design cues to this were similar to the Singer. So we went, we decided to go golf and working with our Porsche, our lovely Porsche representatives, and they helped us come up with this. The orange wheels, as you can see, the golf orange wheels. Yeah, um, the inlays cool. were painted. We did the stripes in golf orange, golf blue. And we actually, funny enough, had to pay a royalty fee to golf to be able to do this. <laughs> but we thought it was worth it. It's definitely worth it. I, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised that they ultimately have like yeah. a, a, not a patent, but they, they've kind of owned the golf colors. Right. So I guess I'm not surprised you had to pay for that. It is definitely worth it. It looks insane. And it's one of those specs that it, it creates a lot of conversation. It's a, it's a, people love it or they hate it. They love it or hate it, which is, which is good. I, I think that invokes conversation because a lot of people, especially with limited edition cars, such low numbers, a lot of people tend to just go base specs or, you know, launch spec. Whereas, you know, we kind of like to yeah, take our own. <laughs> yes. We like to have our own interpretations on these things. And, um, I think that just makes them more special in the long run too. Definitely. It's a fascinating. Car. Yeah. And it's a fabulous car to drive. Oh, no question yeah now we're standing in front of a car that i think is really special we were talking yeah. about how mercedes-benz occasionally just demonstrates that the germans do have a sense of humor <laughs> right make something completely off the wall so yeah. this is a mercedes 190e but not only that it's an evo 2 that's correct uh, which is made for homologation racing purposes and it they went nuts with this car the right. rear wing alone is one of the greatest oh, yeah. things ever put on a car this body kit is just iconic so how did you guys come to have this one in your collection? This was from, and this is a highly original car, so it's never been painted. It's only got about 7,700 kilometers on it. We do drive it, so it does get driven. It was actually gonna be at Young Timers. I, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a car that gets driven uh, around town and it's a beautiful car. Uh, we purchased it at an auction and it was previously owned by a Japanese collector who obviously took meticulous care of it as we do now. It's one of those icons of the collection. It's such a standout for the period. It's as old as me, born right. in 1990. Right. Uh, and it was one of those cars for me personally growing up. I never thought I would see one in person and yet uh, here we are. Here it is. I've driven one. So it's uh, it, this, this, this car stands a special place in my heart. I think we're gonna just continue to see. Definitely. Well, I, I was so in awe of the DTM to see that. And oh yeah, yeah. Like right along that line of just in absolutely insane Mercedes Benzes. I know like we were talking earlier, like, they're not particularly fast. No, but it they looks, don't need to it be. It just looks so insane. Yeah. They look fast, which is, really <laughs> fast, which is part of the battle. But yeah, this is just, to see one sitting here is just like, it's one of the, again, one of those cars I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I just. In the Mercedes fashion, you, you sit in it and it has the smell. You press the button to raise and lower the suspension. It's got all the right things. And it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those cars that doesn't matter. Similar to the Porsche we were just talking about. You can be going 20 miles an hour in this and you're just like, what, you know. Well, very it's special another, place. It's another to be. one where like most people wouldn't know what it is. But if a if I saw one of these things driving around, yeah, you're turning around, turning and you're, around. Yeah, <laughs> you're following it. That's yeah, a, that's a drop everything you're doing to follow this car, right. this car sort of thing. But yeah, just crazy to see one sitting in. Yeah, Amazing. very cool. Now this for me might be one of the craziest Mercedes fences ever made. I, I agree. The most sinister looking, most just crazy car they ever made. Bi turbo V12, and then they took an SL, put a hard top. On yep, it, and that's the SL65. Yeah. And I love that too. You know, they, the Mercedes probably had to make a tool essentially to make a hard top for 
175 or so cars, I can't, which is incredible to think about. Truly incredible. And when I was younger, when the Black Series Mercedes were first coming to the United yep. States, it's like, the CLK is still one of my favorite yes. cars we were talking about yesterday. I just love that car. I think such it, a presence. It's, it's such a presence. And just one of my favorite Mercedes ever. But this car, like, just looks like a Batmobile. Yeah. The huge fender flare, <laughs> that wing that pops up. It just, it's so it's, crazy. It's hysterical. And when you're driving it and you look in the the side view mirror, you just see the massive fender flare. It just like obstructs everything. It's just a beautiful thing. Like you said, this engine, I mean, the power it has is unlike anything else. It's the ultimate German muscle car. And I don't think I've ever seen another one on the road. I think there's a reason for that. Cause it's- the, Yeah. <laughs> and that, the suspension is not exactly uh, yeah. compliant in this car. Right. Uh, yeah. Compared to normal SLs, it's, it truly is a whole other level. When I, many years ago, I was doing a Ferrari Owners Club event, and mm -hmm. I didn't bring his Ferrari for whatever reason, probably in the shop, like mine was a lot, but he brought his SL65 Black Series, and it was like, to see that thing on the road, it was just like, oh my God. Yeah, it was, it's it was, one of those oh my God cars. It's absolutely, and especially for car enthusiasts, like, it's just, it just has so much presence. I think you, this is unlike the 190E we talked about in the Porsches before, like, if this comes up behind you and you're a normal person, I think, who doesn't know anything about cars, like, you can tell, it, it's not a normal Mercedes. It just looks right. like that. Yeah. Deal. And that's that's why I've always gravitated to them. That, and I think that this engine, the bi-turbo V12, um, is one of the most impressive engines ever put in any road car. Agreed. The sheer amount of power and the way it pulls up, uh, just like that turbine-like, and just- It's scary. Oh, it's honestly scary. scary. Yeah. There's there's very few cars that I was like, you know, that I've driven that I'm like, ho like, oh my God, this is one of them where I don't even want to go 60% on the throttle. Because so it's just torque. so much torque, yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it truly is a special thing. So I'm glad we have it. Oh, I'm glad you guys have it too. <laughs> Again, that really fits into the theme with, Mercedes-Benz does play another role in your collection. Yeah. And that fits into the, the theme of just like supercars and just insane Mercedes-Benz. Right. I'm now joined by a man who needs no introduction. This is Donald Osborne. He is the Audrain Museum. And, and I'm so thrilled to get to meet you. Um, I've watched your content for years, so I'm kind of like gushing and I'm kind of starstruck to be honest with you. But more importantly, you are an Italian car. You love all cars, but you really love Italian cars. I do love Italian cars. It's a very funny thing. People have this idea that I only love Italian cars. It is not true. <laughs> I've got English cars, French cars. I've had Japanese cars. I've had all sorts of cars, American cars. And it, there is a thing that Italian cars seem to speak to me in a very personal way that a lot of other cars don't. What I really love about cars in general, and specifically cars of any country, are cars that really reflect their national characteristics. In an age when cars are becoming more and more homogenized across the world, Italian cars have kept more of their national characteristics than I think any other manufacturer. Yes. We're here with an Italian car, and an Italian car which is very much of a cars and bids era iconic status. Absolutely. The F40. Absolutely. And of, as far as young timers go, these cars have become incredibly collectible recently. They built a lot of these cars, over 1,300 of them, but they've really skyrocketed in value. But I think for people of my age and like the Cars and Bids audience, like the F40 is worshipped as just a hallowed car. It, it's so, it was emblematic of its era, but it also was, it did so many things for Ferrari. It took them over 200 miles an hour. It's the last car that Enzo, you know, really worked on. And so it's always been special. And even the follow-ups, the F50 was, at its time, it was compared to the F40 and people were like, eh. One of the challenges with the F50, as wonderful as it is, it was never designed to be a car to be raced. The F40, while never having been raced by the factory, was developed for racing. One of the things about this car too that I think really makes it iconic in any uh, sense of the word is the fact that it is very pure to what Ferrari stands for. What's great about the F40 is the F40 is elemental in basic ways. At the same time as Porsche was building 959, an absolutely amazing car that showcased all the latest technologies, Ferrari very deliberately said, we are going to build a car that is just about the basics, about what Ferrari is, an engine, a great chassis, and go. That's it, yep. And I love the F40 because it's a modern car that feels like an old car. You know exactly what the car is doing all the time. There's nothing to insulate you and the road. It feels like a race car, because that's what race cars do. Race cars don't make you comfortable and they're not worried about noise, vibration, and harshness in a race car. <laughs> a staple of any collection though. Yes, an F40 indeed. is just, oh, I'm, so, I'm still like giddy around this car. But there are lots of Italian cars in this collection to talk about. So let's move on to another Ferrari, shall we? Let's talk about the 400. Let's do it.
And now we're with the 400i. Now, personally, I have always loved these cars. I think they're, they don't look like Ferraris, what people expect a Ferrari to be. But I love that they're two plus twos. I love that you could have one with a manual, um, not in the US, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. But I think that these cars are, have been severely underrated for a long time. They're beginning to appreciate for sure. But you actually owned one. So Indeed, I did. Um, I, too, have always loved the 400, uh, 365. Uh, two plus two is the first started out. Not simply because it's a two plus two, it's actually a four seater car. Two adults can sit in the back behind two adults, which is astonishing. Yeah. And I also love the architecture of the design. I'm a big design freak. This particular design was actually a design that Pinafrina adapted three times. The same basic shape is the 400, the Fiat 130 Coupe, the Rolls Royce Camargue. So it's, it's, it's a shape that, that's very familiar and very elegant and very practical as well. Derek Bell had a very, very famous road test in the magazine Car when the 928 came out, and he drove a 928 automatic, and he said he loved it. And people were horrified. Oh my God, you're a race car driver, and this is a Porsche. How could you love an automatic? And he said, no, you're out of your minds, because the transmission suited the car for its purpose. It's an express. It's a big, comfortable, quiet, cruising car with a great deal of effortless power. It seems slightly unseemly to him to have to row it through the gears. And I have the same feeling about this car. This car, is the manual gearbox, is a wonderful car. It's great to drive. It's one performing. But it's like you're working too much yeah. somehow. It's like you've, got, you've gotten all dressed up in a tuxedo to clean your gutters. <laughs> why are you doing that? Yes, you can do it, but why? The automatic, especially the turbo hydromatic 400 transmission that's in these cars, first of all, that transmission is a brilliant transmission. And you have not lived until you have the kick down on a turbo hydromatic with a V12 in front of it. Oh my God, it is spectacular. <laughs> None of these cars were ever imported into the US by Ferrari. They were all gray market imports or post imports when they became old enough to come in. My car, however, was brought in when it was new and was federalized. So wow. it had the little welded in patch in the gas tank so it could only accept an unleaded uh, fuel nozzle. It had an 85 mile per hour speedometer, which was <laughs> fabulous because they, of course, what they did was they took the regular speedometer and just um, resprayed the numbers. They didn't have to change the calibration. <laughs> so it stopped numbers here at 85 and then just kept going as if, hmm. So there's nothing like pegging the speedometer in your Ferrari. <laughs> That's incredible. It was absolutely fabulous. Now I want to move on from this car because there are two cars I want to talk about. And they're the ones on my shirt. Since <laughs> they're both in this building, I think we'll go talk about the older Bugatti first and then we'll talk about the new ones. That's like good Let's do it. Bugatti has always been a powerhouse of engineering. So can you tell us more about this specific car? Because this is truly one of the most beautiful cars I've ever seen, but it's also very important for Bugatti. Uh, this is a 1936 Bugatti Type 57 Ventoux Coupe. And in the uh, typical fashion of design making no sense arithmetically, this is a two-window coupe because it doesn't have <laughs> rear windows, even though it's got, of course, a windshield in the rear window. That's another story. This is a car that represented the absolute epitome of the Bugatti mark. The Type 57 was the last of the cars that was designed by Ettore Bugatti and his son, Jean Bugatti. Mm -hmm. From the invention of the car, as we know it, back in 1886, the Benz Spot Motorwagen, uh, through to the start of World War I, the pace of development was so incredibly fast. Engineers generally sought to make cars faster by making them bigger. You made yes. bigger engines, so you had cylinders that were the size of, of, of dinner platters <laughs> and, uh, you know, 16 and a half liter four-cylinder cars that would yeah. achieve 100 miles per hour before World War I, which is frightening. It's terrifying. Ettore Bugatti was one of those people who was thinking in the contrary manner in the 19-teens because he helped develop the baby Peugeots, and the idea was smaller and lighter yeah. makes more sense. You can get as much performance out of something which is smaller and lighter as you can with something that's absolutely giant and heavy. Jean Bugatti was even more imaginative than his father. In a strange parallel with poor Edsel Ford and Henry Ford, he was not only a, an engineer uh, to his father's taste, but also a great designer. So he actually designed the body of this car. This particular example is also an extraordinary example because it has never been restored. This is the original color scheme. It was painted all black at one point, and then it was brought back to this original two-tone color scheme. The interior is completely original. Actually, the front seat cushions have been replaced. We have the original seat cushions wow. as well. Every panel on this car 
you open up every panel, you'll see the stamp number of the body on the fenders, on the hood, inside the doors, inside the, the, the um, tool compartment, inside the trunk lid. It's absolutely astonishing. This is a car that drives exactly the way the technicians in Molsheim built it in 1936. The people in the Bugatti Owners Club take these on tours across the United States, across the Alps. These are cars meant to be driven and that can be driven today. You can drive this car on the highway today. It's not the most fun thing to drive on a highway because you want a curving road. You want to, to, to ease up on the throttle and push the throttle. You don't want to just keep it as a droning 70 miles per hour. It's capable of it, but you don't want to do that. But you think about this, the car built in 1936, you can use on the street today without being afraid of traffic. That's astonishing. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And of course, this unbelievable styling. It yeah. just, it's such a special car. But as, you, as we alluded to, there are really a couple different eras of Bugatti. This is the era that a lot of car collectors think of, but a lot of modern people think of the Veyron and the Chiron. So let's go now talk about the modern era of Bugatti. Absolutely. And now we come to the Chiron. And of course, not only can you not walk past the Chiron, you have to talk about it when it's around, <laughs> but also it bookends the whole odd train experience. You have cars that are pre-war, you have all of these amazing cars, but you also have very modern, very historically relevant cars. And that's one of the things I love just being able to wander around here like a true kid in a candy store, to be honest with you. But this car is very important to talk about because it really marks the end of the Veyron Chiron thing the big 16-cylinder quad-turbocharged engine, the pursuit of top speed as a, as a design brief. Uh, and this car is just very special. So to be around one of these is, it, it is a treat for sure. The revival of a mark is a very dangerous and risky business. A lot of people have tried it, a lot of people are still doing it. In order to succeed and be credible, it has to have something of the original intention of the original mark. Bugatti was always about the engine and great chassis. And they paid attention to that in making the car. They didn't just plop a proprietary engine or something and, and put badges on a swoopily designed car. And I think that's an important thing. And that's one of the reasons why these cars have achieved the status that they achieved. Now, of course, another part of it is, of course, the top speed okay. and, and horsepower and all that. The focus on this car still was engineering. And that's what Bugatti was always about, was engineering. And obviously, this is a very different approach to the Type 57, but it's, it's, not about, it's, it's not about necessarily lightweight and delicacy. No. It's, it's got a sledgehammer of an engine. It's brute force, yes. without a doubt. Absolute brute force. But frankly, if the design brief is to make the fastest car in the world, that is what you need to do. But to your point, yeah, sure, it's a zero-sum game. But nonetheless, this car, you know, it's instantly recognizable by people um, and sort of representing this end of the Concorde era for cars where they are just just these marvels of engineering. I mean, what a way to go out. Just such a unique and special car. And it looks great in your shirt. And it looks great on a t-shirt. And that is the entire Audrain Automotive Museum. This has been an unbelievable experience for me to be able to come through this entire facility, look at all the cars they have here, and well, frankly, just nerd out over the cool stuff that's here. And of course, if you're in Newport, Rhode Island, be sure to check out the Audrain Automotive Museum. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye.